to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in those days there was no king over israel every man did what was right in his own eyes judges chapter 21 verse number 25 in the dark days of judges there is a man by the name of samson who teaches us some lessons about life and how a person ought to approach God with the proper attitude. We welcome you today to our study of the Old Testament lessons. We're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today, and we want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. The Church of Christ in your local area would love for you to visit them. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to have a Bible study, they'd be more than happy to sit down and study the Scriptures with you. At the Lord's Church, you'll find people who love God, love His Word, and are concerned about lost souls. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of God's Word. You can access our website, thegospelofchrist.com, where we have a host of free Bible study materials. If you'd like to have a copy of this lesson or any of our lessons, they're available free of charge. Just go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, fill out a media request form, and we'd be happy to send that material to you. In today's lesson, we're thinking about one of the heroes. Some people think of the heroes of the Old Testament, although Samson did end up being a hero. Samson made a lot of blunders along the way that we can learn from. And so Samson is a man that in a lot of ways we can learn what not to do from his life. But as we mentioned in the outset of this lesson, the book of Judges uh, is a dark time in Israel's history. There is this cycle in the book of Judges where the people are right with God, everything's prospering and going well, then they begin to want to be like the nations around them. They begin to go into idolatry. Uh, as a result, the heathen nations conquer them. They will finally come to their senses, call out to God. God will send them a deliverer or judge. He will defeat the enemies. They'll get back right with God. And multiple times throughout the book, that cycle occurs in the uh, life of the people. And it's mainly because, as the statement says in Judges 21 verse 25, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Yes, God was still king, but they weren't letting him be king in their life. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Judges is the typical example of anarchy. Everybody is living the way they want to live. No law of God, no thought of God in their heart many times, and they're just living the way they want to live. And as a result, dark days and, and trouble comes for the people of Israel. But today we study about one judge by the name of Samson. Here are some things that are interesting about Samson's life. Samson was a Nazarite from birth. According to Judges 13, God specially selected and chose him to be a unique class of people known as a Nazarite. A Nazarite, by its very nature, was someone who was separated from normal life for the special purpose of God. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 following. A Nazarite was to keep any type of juice, grape juice, or strong drink. It wasn't able to eat grapes. He was to keep that away from him. Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 teaches. He was not to cut his hair. This was a sign of his separation and holiness to God, according to Numbers 6, verse number 5. He was not to make himself unclean by touching a dead body or anything uh, like unto that, not even if it was his own family. Numbers chapter 6, verses 6 and 7 says, and of course a Nazarite was to represent and be the epitome of holiness. That's the whole calling of the Nazarite according to Numbers chapter 6, verse number 8. And so Samson was very special, very unique, a very great privilege and honor to be a Nazarite 
uh, on behalf of God and God's people uh, that we find in the Scripture. Now, as you think about practical lessons, even that we can learn from the history of Samson as a Nazarite, there are several things that relate to the Christian. Shouldn't Christians be separated for God's purposes today? The word Nazir literally means separated. And Christians are to be separated to the purposes of God. God says in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17, Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Yes, we are separated to be special and unique today. Paul said, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now listen, and do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Christians are to seek first God's kingdom, Matthew 6, and we are not to be in love with the world. James chapter 4, verse number 4. And like a Nazarite, Christians have to realize that some of the things that people put in their body in this life are not good for them. The Nazarite on the Old Testament was not to drink strong drink or things like that in his separation to God. And Christians must realize that some of the things people put in their body, that's not what a Christian ought to be doing. Drugs, alcohol, things like that, that's not going to help us to live a holy life. That's going to inebriate and cause us to weaken our morals. In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, the Bible says this, Be sober, be vigilant or watchful, be alert, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That word for sober in 1 Peter 5 8, W. E. Vines, Greek scholar, says this, It means to be free from the influence of any intoxicant. If I'm to be sober spiritually, friend, to do that, I can't be inebriated spirit physically. I can't have something in my body that's going to weaken my morals and my alertness. And then, of course, as our lives today, as a Christian, they ought to be a sign of separation to God, should they not? Just like the Nazarite represented, when someone saw a Nazarite, they represented someone who their life was separation to God. Our lives, the way we live, should indicate that we are separated to living for God. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said it this way, Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. People ought to be able to look at Christians and see that we are God's own special people. Titus 2, verse 14, that we're trying to have the mind of Christ Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, and that in everything we do, we're trying to bring glory and honor to Almighty God. We also must realize as Christians today that just as if the Nazarite, when he touched something that would be unclean, he could become unclean. Friend, we need to realize today that there's something that makes Christians unclean, and that's sin. Sin separates a man from God. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, 2 Timothy 1, verse 17. And thus, as God's people, we need to be the epitome of trying to live a holy life. Be holy as He who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. Imitate me as I also imitate Christ, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. We're to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, for without holiness, no one can see God. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 14. Now, as you think about Samson, let's realize some things in Samson's life that were his sins, some things that got in the way of him really living that, that life that represented holiness. One of the things about Samson that stands out as contrary to God's will is that Samson was very prideful, very self-willed, and rebellious. I want you to listen to Judges 14. This text clearly shows he was self-willed and he was out to get what he wanted. Judges 14 verse 1. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as wife. 
Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren, or among all, the peop all my people, that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. When you think about a man who was uh, rebellious and self-willed, that's Samson. God had already commanded his people, already warned his people on multiple occasions, don't intermarry, don't marry the heathens, they're going to pull you away from God, they're not going to help you to be more spiritual. And yet Samson sees this woman. His lust overtakes him. He says to his father and mother, go get her for me. His dad says, wait a minute now, aren't there women among God's people you can exist? I don't care about any of them in essence. She pleases me. Go get her. What type of attitude is that that Samson had? Didn't matter what God wanted. Didn't matter what his parents wanted. Didn't really matter what was right. Samson wanted it. Therefore, Samson thought he needed to have it. You see, too many people in this life are so headstrong that they don't stop and think about what's right. Someone once said, strong heads are never really that strong. We need to have our will in line with the will of God. In the Bible, the scriptures teach us that we shouldn't be out to get what we want. We ought to be out to do what God wants us to do. In fact, the Bible says in Titus 1 verse 7 that elders in the Lord's church are not to be self-willed. That is, it's not what we think, it's not our way, it's not what we want. Elders ought to be in line with God's will. They want to do what God wants for the church, for His plan, and for His mission. You get somebody in who's self-willed and has to have it His way. Friend, that's not going to work in the Lord's church. Christians ought not to be self-centered, but Christ-centered. Mark 12, verse 30, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God needs to come first in our decisions. Not what I want, not what I think, not what's best for me or how I can live this pleasure out in my life. What does God want me to do? That's the real question that we need to be asking. And we need to remember that according to Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, iniquity as idolatry. God does not look lightly on rebellion and Samson epitomizes that here in this context. But when you think about Samson also, let's realize as we look at Samson's life and we think about the things he did, friend, realize this, Samson, instead of listening to his parents, Samson gave in to his lust instead of what his parents tried to teach and instruct him to do. Many people today, if we're not careful, especially young people, can do the same thing. He saw a beautiful woman like David who saw beautiful Bathsheba bathing, his lust overtook him, he got caught up in relations he shouldn't have, and his whole family was affected by it. Young people realize today that your lust and your passions must not control what you do in this life. Christians are taught to flee. 2 Timothy 2 verse 22, flee youthful lusts and rather pursue the things of God, righteousness, holiness, good living, things like unto that. Samson ultimately goes on to violate God's law as it relates to things he does in his life. Listen to Judges chapter 14. Here he is in clear violation of the will of God. Judges 14 verse 5. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. He tore the lion apart as one of tore apart a young goat though he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion, and behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. And so here again you see Samson bent on doing whatever he wants to do. Going to get that woman of the Philistines who he shouldn't have had. And then along the way God's still trying to work through him. This lion comes and he rips the lion apart. A little while later he sees the dead lion's carcass, honey in it. And again his passion and his desire overtakes him. Although he shouldn't have touched a dead carcass, although that would make him unclean, 
according to the old law and would be a violation of God's will, he went and did it anyway. Saw that honey, knew it would taste good. His passion, his desire is overtaking him again, and he goes and takes it, even gives some to his parents. Friend, by taking the honey out of the lion's carcass, Samson made himself unclean. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 27, they were not to touch a dead carcass. We've got to realize today, while we live under a law of God today, those who break God's law, they also become unclean when we don't follow its teaching. Samson didn't listen to God. Went against the teaching of God, and as a result, he became unclean when he should have epitomized holiness. Like Samson, we're under God's law today. That law is the law of Christ. Galatians 6 verse 2, James 1 verse 25, it is the perfect law of liberty. And when we go against God's law, we also stop living holy lives and we separate ourselves from Almighty God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, the Lord's ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, His arms are not shortened that He cannot save, but our sins and our iniquities separate us from God. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, but the wages of sin is death. Samson became unclean, and when men and women today don't follow God's law, they also become unclean. Another powerful lesson that we learn from the life of Samson is that too many times in Samson's life, he gave into peer pressure. Judges chapter 14, verses 10 through 20, we find an example of him giving into the peer pressure there. Listen to this context. Judges 14, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 10. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for young men used to do so. And it happened when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. So they said to him, Pose your riddle so that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days they could not explain the riddle. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You've posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you've not even explained it to me. And he said to her, Look, I have not explained it to my father or my mother, so should I explain it to you? Now she wept on him the seven days while their feast lasted. And it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of the people. When you think about Samson here and his wife, who God didn't want him to take in the first place, peer pressure began to work on him. She wasn't a godly person, and she began to work against Samson in so many ways. Today, if we're not careful, like Samson, peer pressure can cause people to do things they really shouldn't do. Many young people with good morals, good family bringing, raised to know the Lord and follow His teaching, have given in to peer pressure over time to do things that are not right, whether that be to smoke or to drink or do drugs or be involved in sexual relations before that's right, things that you know are not right, things that are immoral, things that you wouldn't naturally do. Sometimes if you get around the wrong people, that's going to influence you for evil. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 through 33, evil companions corrupt good morals. Friend, we need to realize we've got to let God's Word guide us and not let people of the world lead us down a path we ought not to go. How many people have maybe been at a party or been around other people and they wouldn't even think about drinking alcohol and yet when you get around other people and they're doing it and it looks cool and you're not one of the cool ones, you think, well, I've got to do this. Maybe we shouldn't have been around those people to begin with. Those people aren't going to help us to be more godlike in every way. You see, Samson is a man who eventually will give in to worldly concepts rather than biblical teaching. 
today we must not be like Samson, but rather we want to be like Christ. It's not what the world wants and the mold the world wants to shape us into that matters. It's how does Christ want me to live? Hebrews 4.15, Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And the Bible teaches us, according to 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and 22, that we've got to follow the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as you will study the life of Samson, Samson, uh, he goes on to do some things that are, are pretty good. He'll fight some battles. He'll, uh, he'll, God will work through him, but he also will eventually give in to his wife again. She'll ask him, where's your strength? How is it you can do these things? How is it you can defeat the enemies? And of course, he didn't want anybody to know his strength. His strength was given by God, and it was in his long hair. But as you remember, she'll eventually entice him. She'll eventually tell his enemies his strength is in his hair. Now you listen to this. Samson, who was strong and powerful, who at one time the Spirit of God wonderfully worked in, when she tells his secret and they cut his hair, Think of this image of Samson. This is what you need to remember. From going to be a Nazarite and a powerful man, Samson gets his hair cut. His eyes are poked out, gouged out. He is in the dungeon working, as it were, on a, a grist mill, maybe you might think of. And he is basically at the bottom of the barrel of these things. Why did Samson allow those things to happen in his life? And what caused that uh, for God? Well, here's what happened. Samson began to listen to other voices besides God. And as a result, he ends up in the dungeon, blind and without his hair. Now, God's going to allow his hair to grow back. That hair begins to grow back, and you remember, Samson's strength comes back. And Samson is going to do one last valiant thing for God, of which he's probably most well known for. As you remember in the book of Judges, toward the end of Samson's life, as his hair begins to grow back and as he begins to receive that strength from God again. He's blind, so he really can't see what he's doing. But during this time, the uh, heathen nations are having a, a feast or a celebration. And all the rulers are there. It's a two-story building you might think of. And, and uh, up, up above is where everybody's partying at. And so they're honoring them and their gods and living in luxury. And Samson, in one final act of revenge and, and desire to please God, he has somebody take his hands, put those hands against the main pillars in that building, and with all his might and strength, he pushes in that whole building with all those ungodly, idolatrous, idolatrous people comes crashing down on Samson. And in one last act of self-sacrifice, his life brings honor and glory to God as he was called to do. But look at, think about this. Look at what it cost Samson. Think about if he had just learned his lesson earlier. He had to sacrifice himself in the end to bring glory to God and die doing so. What if he had chose a woman from God's people? What if he had not touched those things that were unclean? What if the peer pressure hadn't uh, affected Samson like it did? What if he hadn't been so prideful and self-willed and had such a great desire to please himself over God? Friends, Samson's life could have turned out a lot better than it did. Can you imagine as he's blind with both of his hands on those columns, the things that must be flashing through his mind, knowing that it's about to all come to an end? What if I'd only put God first? What if? I hadn't been so prideful. What if everything I looked at, I didn't have a, a desire and a lust for? What if Samson had made those choices sooner in life? Young people especially, listen very carefully. There are a lot of things in life that are going to tempt you, just as they tempted Samson. Those things are not going to help you. A lot of those things, the, the lust of flesh, Lust the eyes, the pride of life, 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17. Those things, although they may appeal to you, and although there may be a, a momentary impulse pleasure to them, realize, just like in Samson's life, those things are not going to help you to be a godly person. Oh, there's going to be attraction of the opposite sex. There, there's going to be desire for things of this world, pleasure and passion and, and, and things that will make you feel good in life. Friend, the thing we need to ask ourselves above all else is, will this help me to honor God with my life? 
In Acts 4 verse 13, it is said of the, the fishermen who followed Jesus, when they realized they were untrained and uneducated men, then they realized they had been with Jesus. Friend, that's what matters in our life. Are we living our life according to the Bible? Don't let peer pressure, remember, the Bible says in Romans 12 verse 2, do not be transformed to this world, but be renewed by the changing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable will of the Lord. Don't, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Rather, you follow the mold of Christ. You follow the pattern of Christ in everything that He said and did. Friend, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the teaching of the Lord initially? The Lord tells us what we've got to do to be saved. In Romans chapter 10, verse number 17, the Bible says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I know I've got to have faith to be saved, for in Hebrews 11, verse 6, the Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. How do you get faith? By hearing the Word of God. Have you heard the message of the Bible, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that no man comes to the Father except by Him, John 14, 6? If you've heard that message, then friend, are you willing to commit your life to it? The Bible says in Acts 2, verse 38 through 47, that they, they, they heard that word and they responded by being pricked in their heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts chapter 2, verse number 36. Having believed that, are you willing to repent? Again, Acts 2, 38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Having repented, turned from sin and turned to God, would you be willing to be baptized to get into God's kingdom? Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5, And then, to live a life of holiness and separation to God, would you walk in newness of life every day, being faithful unto death, Romans 6 verse 4, Revelation 2 verse 10. Our hope today in studying the life of Samson is that we can look at his life and we can learn not to do that. And in so doing, we'll be prepared to live our lives in such a way that they will truly magnify God in everything that we say and do. May God help us to have that faith and to follow Him every day. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.